I'm just confirming here, I did get word that um, not only has the website back up, thank you very much for doing that, but the agenda items for the few agenda changes that we made for this afternoon looks like they are live. So please go ahead and uh, check the agenda online so you know what's going on this morning. Um, so right now I want to invite uh, Girish up. Girish, there we go. And uh, something that I find really interesting, we're going to learn about some uh, advancements in, I guess, uh, internet on airplanes, right? Yep. Oh, excellent. Thank you. This is the pointer? Yes, it's green. Good afternoon. So, Many of us travel very frequently on airplanes, and most of us traveled on airplanes to get here. So um, when you're on an airplane, you know, some of us sign up for um, internet access on the airplane, and um, you know, the speeds um, and the page load times, page load times um, tend to be um, somewhat slow, so um, what we wanted to do was to reimagine what uh, high-speed connectivity on an airplane would look like. And so we went about um, building a system um, that is going to—it's currently trialing on JetBlue and um, very soon on United. Um, so um, what I will um, talk about today is um, some of the ingredients that go into building such a system. Um, so it's, it's pretty high level, it's an overview talk, um, but if you want to get into the details of it, uh, you can talk to me offline. Where am I pointing to? Okay. So um, imagine you were working at home and you know, you're banging your you know, keyboard and now you've decided to um, catch a flight. You know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to get the same sort of experience that you were um, getting at home up in the air, right? Most of the time, people um, do this because, you know, sign up for internet service essentially to check emails. Um, to connect to, you know, do some work. But what if you could also watch a video um, in addition to um, doing Skype calls and all these other sorts of things that you normally do at home? Um, so, what, you know, most, most people, you know, what, it's interesting that the uptake rate on internet services is somewhat limited in airplanes for two reasons. One, it's slow. Second, uh, people have to pay for it. Now, JetBlue has announced something called FlyFi, um, which is Wi-Fi on airplanes, um, which provides um, two things, free and fast internet service in the, um, in the air. So um, um, what we um, decided to do is to offer um, 12 megabits to each passenger. So today, most planes get probably a T1 type connection to the plane. Um, what if you could get um, high speed 12 megabit to each passenger? Um, and so um, when, you know, during our trials, um, we are finding that you know, uh, compared to some of the other experiences that you have today, we can get um, pages loading eight to 10 times faster, sometimes even higher than that. Um, and so um, it, there are a lot of things that go into building such a, th um, a system. Um, and um, I know some of you um, are familiar with um, Wildblue, um, the service provider, um, satellite service provider um, that you know, I've heard um, it talked about and compared um, against, um, I think in a couple of nanogs ago, there was some comparison about performance of various um, ISPs um, under rain and so on. Um, anyway, Viasat, um, brief overview, um, is a service provider. Um, it's also a communications technology company, 
and it's also a satellite operator. We have a, 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 a growing number of satellites that we either build. Um, we have um, recent, we recently launched um, Viasat 1, which won the Guinness World Record in terms of the capacity on the satellite. So um, it, it takes a number of things that go into building a 12 megabit service to a passenger. The first thing that, um, that needs to happen is, you know, you have to go back to some basic um, communication theory. And um, much like Moore's law, there's Shannon's law of um, uh, channel cap information capacity. So C there represents channel capacity. Um, it says channel capacity is directly proportional to the bandwidth and is related to uh, logarithmically to the signal to noise ratio you get. Um, you can get so it directly tells you what sort of levers you have to push and pull in order to drive more capacity. Um, so this this random coding bound is is sort of an upper bound on capacity, um, and you're better off trying to drive bandwidth up um, because it has a direct ratio as opposed to a logarithmic ratio of signal to noise ratio. So one of the things that we did was to build really high capacity satellites. So if you, the, the reason why most, um, most air to ground systems don't work fast is simply because the B, the bandwidth, is small. It's in the order of a few megahertz. Um, and that's partly because um, the spectrum av available at that FCC grants out is in small chunks because it's highly desirable spectrum in the lower bands. So the, in, in the chart that you see there, um, there are bands um, called L band, which is typically in the slightly above cellular coverage and you know, it, it's typically in your home you know, cordless telephone range. And then you have KA band, which is typically in the 10 to 14 gigahertz, and K, uh, sorry, KU band, and KA band is somewhere between 20 and 30 gigahertz. So those uh, higher um, frequencies tend to bring with it um, some challenges, and so the other lower frequencies tend to be much more frequently used, and with its simple economics dictate that you know, when there is more demand, the price goes up. And so, um, and, and as a commodity, that, that's in, um, also doled out very, um, you know, it's rationed out by the FCC. So when you have limited bandwidth, your information capacity is going to be small. Um, and so the other aspect of it is that when you have lots of bandwidth um, and you have the... Um, the ability to use those, that, that bandwidth, um, then commensurately you can drive service prices down. Um, so, you know, information, you know, just to kind of recap is like, a, you know, capacity is like, um, it, it's, it's like water being carried through the pipe. The bigger the pipe, the more water you can carry through it. So if you take KU band, you know, like your direct to home, uh, dish or direct TV type applications, they tend to operate in the KU band. And they, if you plug in chug, you know, signal to noise ratios, the maximum capacity that you can drive out of those types of satellites and bands is like, you know, a few tens of megabits per second. So um, given that you have, uh, you know, this the same problem exists in the cellular world. Um, so um, on the left is shown KU, um, the, the yellow spot covers all of the U.S. and it's a KU band satellite that covers all of the U.S. But the, another way is to use KA band and you have spot beams, much like the terrestrial cellular um, networks that you find um, all over. So. Um, you know, given that, you know, you got some bandwidth to play with, what else can you do with it? Well, can you squeeze more juice out of the lemon, you know? So um, can you get more colors, you know, colors, um, 
allow you to represent information, you know, it, different colors allow you to discriminate between um, regions. So it, uh, in mathematics, there's this thing called a four color theorem. It says if you have a map that's divided into regions, no more than four colors are required to color the regions so that no two adjacent regions have the same color. So that's a very um, uh, important thing that's used often in cellular um, telephony and also in spot beam satellites. And so um, what we do is extract more band, uh, more, more colors out of the given bandwidth by using polarization. And polarization is a little bit, you know, think of polarization. Um, an easy way to think about it is, you know, you tie a string to the end of uh, a fixed, uh, and, um, fixed point and then you wiggle the string one way and you, have tra you generate transverse waves going one way and you wiggle the string in, in the orthogonal way and you generate waves going the orthogonal way. So electromagnetic waves are somewhat like that and you can, um, car you know, they can be used to create colors in adjacent regions. And the other thing that you can do is if you have a lot of spectrum, you can carve out channels and then add colors that way. So, so those are the um, ways in which you can get more um, capacity, essentially driving up the B in Shannon's or Shannon Hartley theorem. Um, and so that's what we do um, with, with, our, with, our, uh, with our network. The other um, challenge is coverage. And typically, um, satellite operators tend to make a trade between one of two dimensions. The, you know, it's, it's either coverage or capacity. And so with this new class of satellites, what we have done, you know, so on, the, on, on, on your right, you'll see sort of the traditional um, clustering of satellites that have more or less chosen coverage over capacity. And with the new class of satellites, you know, it's called high throughput satellites, we're trying to drive more capacity. And with the new generation of satellites that we just announced, it, there's also, we're driving to higher coverage areas as well. And on the top right side, you'll see um, pretty amazing coverage that you'll see across um, the Atlantic. And what that means is you can get, when you're flying from, um, from US to Europe, you can get very high speed connectivity across the Atlantic as well. So, um, um, yeah, so the program that we're um, trialing out now is for large, um, large bodied aircraft, um, primarily um, JetBlue and um, United, a continental fleet of the United. Um, and it, it'll be available on the A320, um, 737, 757, and Embraer jets. Totals about 400 aircraft, and we're providing all the airtime services um, on it. Um, so let's get into the a little bit into the technical um, uh, um, components that comprise the service. So on the on your right. Um, you'll see um, the antenna and a, you know, a, a yellow box that sits inside the cabin. Now, the antenna sits on a radome. It's like a little, um, little bump. It's about, um, about yay big. Um, that sits on top. There's a little fitting on top of the aircraft. And the antenna sits inside. Um, and um, there is a power supply, there is an antenna control unit, and so on. And, and then it talks to the satellite. It, it's able to receive and transmit um, from, uh, from, the, from the antenna there. Um, on, the, on your left side, you'll see um, sort of a big antenna, um, and you'll see something called an SMTS and modulator. It's a very, very simplified diagram of 
all of the components that go into the hub, and I'll get into that in, in, in the next few slides. Um, but suffice it to say that Base Station, you know, it's similar to a cellular telephony network, and the base stations basically back all the traffic into, or the, you know, the RAN traffic into a, an evolved packet core, and from the core you get an access to the internet. Um, so, um, I was talking briefly about the um, antenna. The shown in the picture is the um, antenna on your right. Uh, in the middle is a modem that's able to transmit and, and receive and a power supply unit. So those are the three sort of line replaceable units and then there's next to the antenna something called an antenna control unit. So um, what happens is we get um, telemetry and GPS information and then um, drive the antenna to point to the satellite at all times. So unlike the air-to-ground system which work at lower frequencies where you can have sort of omnidirectional antennas, here you, can, um, you have to have very high directivity antennas. And what that means is that as the aircraft is moving around, you have to keep the antenna pointed at the satellite all the time. And so you need to know at all times where the satellite is, where the, antenna, where the aircraft is in relation to the satellite. So we steer the antenna based on information coming from, um, um, from the um, GPS units mounted next to the antenna or from the um, something called an airing interface from the aircraft itself. Um, the radome is intended to do, you know, uh, provide, give you, um, give environmental pro um, protection and it is designed to minimize aerodynamic load and also provides um, bird strike and, you know, lightning protection. So because it's a it's a change to the body of the aircraft. You have to get FAA certifications. Um, you know, it's called supplementary type certification to get um, make it flight worthy. And it all, you know, the radom also has to be designed so that you can have RF signals at KA band going through um, uh, through it with minimal sort of uh, degradation in performance. So. Um, then the next component that's of interest um, that the devices on the satellite talk to are the base stations, or it, we call it um, satellite modem termination system, or like, uh, similar to what cable modem termination systems are. What it does is that it, it operates at two levels. It operates at the phi layer, where it does modulation and demodulation of signals, similar, you know, QPSK or HPSK modulation and demodulation signals. It provides um, forward error correction coding, and it does five-layer algorithms in you know, dealing with fades, and it deals with power, managing power and timing and so on, much like what happens on the Ethernet interfaces um, on terrestrial networks. And, and on the uh, or, or optical things that you know, the previous, one of the previous speakers talked about. Um, then it also uh, deals with um, MAC layer, um, similar to the Ethernet framing. There is sort of um, there is a framing that's used here, and what it does, MT stands for mobile terminal. Mobile terminal needs to log into the network and register and is authenticated and is granted bandwidth um, in order for it to transmit or um, or receive. So. Um, so that's the set of functions of the MAC layer protocols. In addition, it provides radio resource management. Um, what that means is it allows for managing the quality of service provided to that particular terminal. Um, so um, IP tuples are typically mapped into what are called service flows, which are architectural primitives that are used in the MAC layer. Uh, to, to provide um, you know, quality of differentiated quality of service for different applications. And the MAC layer also deals with congestion control um, and load balancing on the satellite beam. 
Furthermore, it deals with um, handover. As the aircraft transitions, you know, goes across the country, it goes from one spot beam to the other, much like as you're driving along a road uh, on a freeway, you're going from one cell tower to the next, or one sector within a cell tower to the next sector within a cell tower. So there are these handover algorithms that um, um, come into play um, that um, essentially uh, allow for seamless um, connectivity um, to to the application or the server that you're connect you know that that you're connected to. In addition, um, we also enhance some of the protocols to deal with. Uh, satellite to satellite handover. So in, in some areas where there is limited coverage, we have other satellites sort of um, taking over, so we need to hand traffic from one satellite to the next, and that poses its own set of challenges. Um, so uh, from a mobility architecture perspective, uh, we, we um, again, like I mentioned before, there is a number of uh, protocols designed to do, deal with handover, but fundamentally there's this CSN um, or connectivity serving um, network um, that talks to multiple access serving networks or, um, and then um, what is shown at the bottom um, is as mobile terminals move from one um, SMTS, so SMTS basically deals with one particular spot beam to the other, um, the protocols uh, tell um, one base station to hand over the mobile terminal's context. And what does a context? Context is really information about the terminal, what its capabilities are, if you're, if you're authenticated or not, if, you're, if you have keys, um, if you have encrypted information, or, is, or what kind of keys are, need to be handed over. All of that context moves along with the terminal um, during the course of the flight. So um, all of the traffic from the terminal goes to um, via the base stations to the ASNs, to the connectivity uh, serving networks and out to the internet. So that's sort of the um, basic um, high level architecture. And like I mentioned before, the user services persist through, um, persist through the handoff process. Um, what that means is pages continue to load, video streams continue, and email and VPN services continue. So there is a brief hiccup when, when for example, if I talked about different colors um, and adjacent beams, and when, um, when a plane goes from one satellite um, beam to the next satellite beams, if, if it goes to a different polarization, the physical layer needs to switch over, so there's a very, very short outage causing a few lost packets, but it's no different than any, you know, indistinguishable from what happens on the internet. Um, so um, that's, um, uh, here's a little more detail about our network. Um, it's, it consists of a set of satellite um, radio access nodes connected to an evolved packet core. There are several nodes in the packet core. We call them core nodes. And um, they're like internet points of presence. They, they provide connectivity, drop-off points to the internet at each of these core nodes. The in, you know, we have one big OSPF area um, that connects all of the RAN, satellite RANs to the um, packet core. and um, we use um, CG NAT uh, for passengers, um, and um, we have to, by um, aircraft or airline regulations, ha also have to provide content filtering um, so that uh, you know passengers are not subject to objectionable content. Um, so that's a little bit of the network infrastructure, um, and in terms of um, redundancy, um, each satellite access node or gateway, we call them, 
is a dual home to two nodes in the packet core. And um, we use routing metrics. One is advertising a higher cost than the other. So um, when one goes away, the other one kicks in and packets are redirected to the core node that um, it was originally home to. If a core node itself fails, then we move um, all of the traffic to the backup core node um, in the network. So um, we, I talked briefly about um, what happens at the Phi layer, what happens at the Mac layer, what happens from a connectivity, IP connectivity standpoint. But um, we talk a little bit about um, TCP, and many of you know TCP wasn't um, originally designed for um, long, fat networks. And so, since then, a number of improvements have been made to the, through RFCs to improve the performance of TCP on a long, fat network. In our case, the, the, we have both high bandwidth and long latencies because of the round trip time to a geostationary satellite. So it impacts a couple of things. It impacts, um, um, you know, so TCP performance is based on the round trip times. So the longer the um, round trip, the worse the performance. And it's also um, proportional to the window size. So, um, you know, the, several of the algorithm parameters are tuned to, so s s slow start is directly proportional to the round trip times and um, has a logarithmic you know, response to the window sizes. So what happens in a long delay network is um, because packets are in flight and the TCP connection has to stay, and the, the buffer sizes have to be um, maintained um, in order to drive higher performance. Otherwise, you'll end up getting caught up in the slow start um, part of the TCP congestion algorithm. Uh, and the back off algorithm as well. Um, so um, we, we do the following. We split the connection into three chunks. We have a connection from the end user device to the modem on the airplane. We have um, a, a, a TCP proxy between the airplane and the base station. And from the base station, we connect to the server that the user is trying to reach to. Um, by doing this, we can then take control over the window sizing, um, the back offs, and so on. To, and, and we use RFC 1323 to drive up um, window sizes. Um, and then we also don't have the additive increase, multiplicative decrease behavior of the TCP. So we tune the TCP performance that way. We also use. Um, things like selective acknowledgments uh, and so on to drive a higher throughput on TCP. Um, the other thing that um, affects us is the round trip times, and, um, I, like I mentioned, and we try to do sort of um, DNS lookups um, uh, to improve TCP performance. So those are some of the tricks. On the right side is shown a graph. Um, there was two sets of graphs. Uh, one. Uh, um, the, the smaller set of bar charts um, shows you the 50th percentile of a set of pages that um, page, on the y-axis is the page load performance. On the x-axis is the percentile of pages that um, we measured against. Um, so we, we took um, lots and lots of pages and measured the performance of page load times. And the blue bar shows you what the TCP performance looks like if, um, if you didn't do acceleration. Um, the red chart shows you the page load performance with just TCP um, tuning. And then the green chart shows you the, the green bar shows you the performance of um, web page load times with TCP, with DNS, with some of the other HTTPS things, you know, object prefetches and so on we do. And we compare that against the purple graph, which is sort of the fiber, um, um, which is a fiber service which of comparable speed. So we're, we're getting pretty close to 
um, fiber, um, not there yet, um, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to work on it. Uh, so that gives you sort of a, an overview of the sorts of things that we do. So um, what we're trying to do then is to summarize, um, give users a residential-like experience on, um, in the air. Um, and the ways of doing it is sort of to get higher, you know, um, more spectrum, reuse spectrum, and then, um, and then we compensate for higher delays over the satellite by uh, manipulating um, some of the protocols in order to get the higher performance. Um, that's, um, that's, the, that's the talk. Any questions? I thought I ran out. Um, yeah, I know. Our name is Andrew Weller. Uh, uh, almost 10 years ago, I gave a very <coughs> similar talk with an of mine in this forum and other, with other, other forums um, under the connection by Boeing program. And one of the things that we learned during that program was that, from what I can see, you guys are using the same BGP movement of prefixes that we did, was that it caused quite a significant number of BGP updates within the BGP table. Um, when you have a certain number of aircraft flying. And I realize that not all of your aircraft are going to um, change uh, ground stations, but I think that's something that over time we need to figure out how to solve that problem for IP networks over um, uh, low, that are globally connected. So I the first question is, uh, have you done any more research in this area into solving that problem? And the second, just comment for you to uh, answer the question is that for those who really, I think, want to see high speed internet access on airplanes, um, at least in the United States, in a non over water situation, there needs to be more bandwidth available from air to ground. Right now it's 3.25 megahertz for the GoGo system. And that's paltry compared to what we could have in that situation. And having more bandwidth from the FCC um, at some point in time in the future will certainly be able to change the way that we are connecting uh, when we're airborne. So thank you for your talk, and uh, I think it's really great to see that 10 years on, we're still chugging these same things. Well, th um, thank you. So um, I'll take that in the reverse order. So I think uh, Qualcomm has recently. Uh, filed a petition with the FCC for higher, um, you know, higher bandwidth allocations. So, uh, as with a number of these types of spectrum allocation um, requests, um, there are a number of parties that are, you know, um, involved in the in the process. Um, like you pointed out, um, the AirCell GoGo is three megahertz. The Qualcomm request is for 150 megahertz, so it's it's 50 times more. And the system that I was just talking about deals with 500 megahertz, so which we've already been granted. So there's no contention in the spectrum allocation at all. On the second part, so we um, all of the as planes go from one base station to the other, we're not really advertising. Um, the reachability of that aircraft from that particular base station. Instead, we backhaul the traffic all over the way, all the way to the CSN. And so there's really one point from which we do that. So it's in that sense very similar to the home agent, foreign agent concept in uh, terrestrial cellular networks. So. Uh, thank you for the uh, clarification. That was one of our design choices that we chose differently in our first appointment. So. Uh, Dan Conroe with Virtualize. Uh, you mentioned you're using CG now. I was wondering, uh, are you supporting V6 or planning on supporting V6? Um, so we're we're testing out V6 at this point. Um, we're not quite sure what our timeline for the rollout is, but yes, that's in the plan.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Grish. Something to think about on our flight home uh, later this week. So just a few things I want to mention. Um, we're about to start a break from 2.30 to 3 p.m., so come back here at 3. Uh, once again, thanks to our sponsors for this break, uh, Myriad Supply, PacNet, and XKL. There's some snacks and some, uh, some swag out there for you to pick up. Also, uh, just to clarify on the survey giveaways, you know, this is, remember, this is the first time we did the kind of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday instead of the Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I, even I got a little confused. We are announcing survey giveaways tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. when we open. That's going to be for today's survey. The next one is Wednesday, 9.30 a.m. when we open the conference. That's going to be for Tuesday's th survey. And then again, Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. right before uh, Betty's up here to announce the election results. So as a reminder, you have to be here in the room if you want to receive your uh, iPad mini and other bag of goodies from uh, Limelight. Uh, Tuesday, 2.30, Wednesday, 9.30 and Wednesday at 3.30. Also, uh, keep in mind that the ballots are open. We're going to be voting until Wednesday a.m., so please, if you are a Nanog member, log on to the nanog.org site. Don't try it right now, because apparently it's not loading, so just uh, give a few minutes for that to get back up. But shortly, log on to the nanog.org site and vote for, um, vote for the, the members. Also, um, if you don't have a, the ability to vote on nanog.org, it's because you're not actually a member. So please consider joining the Nanog membership. It's not necessarily very expensive, and you get a lot of benefit for your buck, as well as the community in general. I think the, uh, the, uh, all of the number of first-timers we have today really demonstrates how valuable Nanog continues to be for the network operator community. And um, that's it. Enjoy your break. We'll see you back here at 3 o'clock.